Hi, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Steffi. And I'm Donya Williams. Hello, this pretty Sunday. It looks like it's very beautiful outside, but I know it's cold. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just a bit chilly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as always, everyone, thank you so much for spending the next hour with us. Yes. Yeah, so today, guys, we want. I want to. I don't know about Brian, but I want to jump right in. Um, we're going to learn about the fugitive slave database. So we're talking with Dr. Sean Wallace. Sean is a social historian of the 18th and 19th century United States. His research examines transatlantic slavery with a particular focus on fugitives and fugit fugitivity in the U.S. South. He was awarded his PhD from the University of Stirling in Scotland, UK, and has been a lecturer in United States history at the University of Bristol, England, UK, since 2018. His monograph, In Pursuit of Freedom, Enslaved Runaways and Resistance in the U.S. South, 1790 to 1860, is forthcoming with the University of Georgia Press. It is the first systematic investigation of fugitive slave advertisements in early national Georgia and Maryland. Sean is also the creator of the Fugitive Slave Database, a unique digital archive pres preserving American fugitivity advertisements from the U.S. South. So right now, I would like you guys to welcome Dr. Sean Wallace. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Donya. Awesome, awesome. I'm so excited that you're here because this is all new for me because I couldn't find anything. Normally, Brian and I, we do this whole research thing before we, you know, get on the show and everything. And we'll do something the day before. We'll do something the day of. We'll just start looking at different YouTubes or videos or pulling up stuff. And it's not a lot of stuff to pull. Mm -hmm. So this is this is just awesome. So I guess I want to start broad and then start getting more narrow into the subject. It kind of, you know, um, as, as our audience is aware, I, I lived in England for 30 years. So I'm plus, you know, part of that kind of uh, British academic framework. And it just strikes me that over the, like, say, the last five to six years, there's been a real concerted effort for British universities to start looking at American slavery. And... Do you kind of know where that, what led to that movement, where that movement's kind of coming out of? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make too broad a, too broad a generalization as to, to what I think. There's a, there's a whole host of uh, factors motivating it. Uh, from my point of view, I, I would just say that you know, um, certainly at Bristol, I think that you know, it comes from a real, um, a real desire uh, and, and want to. Uh, to understand, um, uh, you know, historic links with um, the trade of enslaved people, um, and I know that you know certainly on the, um, you know, with the kind of academic staff, um, there's, you know, basically there's a <laughs> not only the people that are working on slavery and, and issues of race and things like that, but I think you know across our department, across our university, I think there's a real um, there's a real want to understand uh, and a real want to to uh, to take a take account and to to um you know for for anything the research finds that but it is an ongoing uh, process we have um uh, we have we have uh, staff that are working directly on this at the moment so it is ongoing research um uh, at present but, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and i guess for the benefit of our american audience mm -hmm. the you know the fact is bristol itself had a lot of sea captains who were involved in the in the slave trade and the trans transatlantic slave trade, uh, just like Liverpool. I'm not familiar with any other kind of port cities in, in, in Britain that were that were actively engaged. Was it just was it mainly those two or were there were there others? I think places like Glasgow as well, I think uh, in Scotland um uh, is another uh, another university that's done a great deal um of, of research and work into uh, historic mm -hmm with with the uh, trade of enslaved people um, and is it fair to say that perhaps where there are cities and places that profited from slavery and bristol and liverpool definitely were, were two of those and i'm assuming that glasgow would have been another one um there are going to be records that, you know that 
they're going to be surviving records that that people can can access hopefully and and see. Is that a fair assessment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've um, I've, I've attended quite a few talks with um, with scholars that are doing some incredibly important work. Um, and, and yeah, they're they're going through the records and they're um, you know they're they're seeing what they uncover. Yeah. Cool. And I guess what what personally brought you to this project? Uh, the Fugitive Slave Database Project, or mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's really, um, uh, you know, I, I started really with uh, an interest in, in in slavery in the U.S. Actually, my my second year as an undergrad at uh, the University of Stirling, um, uh, and at the time we it, it literally was a it was a survey survey course in U.S. history. Uh, one of the weeks we came across some um, Frederick Douglass's narrative. Uh, I became fascinated by by not only Douglas but um, you know uh, resistance and fugitivity and uh, literacy and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I did a I did an undergraduate project final kind of thesis on uh, on, on Douglas, on Harriet Jacobs, and on Henry Bibb, um, trying to understand what motivated them to um, to escape. Um, and then for my master's project, I wanted to expand. I wanted to keep using the the narratives, but I wanted to try and um, to to develop this database. Um, I felt it was really necessary that um, you know I, I think fugitivity in Georgia and Maryland, in particular, uh, during the early national period, was was better understood. I felt there was a lot of fugitives within mm -hmm. those ads that we didn't really know anything about in terms of the historiography. Mm -hmm. uh, so I basically had, had designed a smaller version of the, the, the current database. Um, and then, yes, during my PhD, uh, I worked on this for about uh, three and a half years, um, building it with uh, my supervisor at the time, Dr. Colin Nicholson, um, and, and with the help of Dr. Ben Marsh as well. Um, and yeah, it just, uh, you know, it's just become this, this resource that, um, yeah, I'm working very hard to try and make it publicly accessible. So a project that means a lot, a lot to me, um, uh, and yeah, I want to, I wanted to be there to share with people uh, as well. And I'm going to re slightly rework a question from an audience member, D. Turner. Sure. So is the emphasis more on the southern colonies and states because those are better documented? And the second part of that question, I suppose, will you ever start looking at advertisements for enslaved people who who ran away? In the northern states, from like Massachusetts all the way down to, say, New York. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really really good question. Um, I, I think the uh, I, I think there's just a huge amount of scope to expand this database wherever uh, wherever the records are. Um, so as we know, you know there were there was slavery in the, in, in all kind of thirteen colonies. Um, the, the reason that I do Georgia and Maryland was driven by by the historiography and the gap. In the early national period, um, but there's, you know, I, I've got some samples in there from South Carolina, from Virginia, um, but but certainly so. If the records are there, um, you know, I've I I, 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 in my research for the the PhD, um, you know, I, I could find the earliest ad being back to 1705. Um, now it's very very different in terms of its kind of typography. Um, than the ads that I've I've designed the database around for the end of the 18th century, but but yeah, realistically, we we could absolutely expand the database into different different states, different colonies, different time periods. Uh, so that could certainly happen. Uh, I've had a few students have have actually added um, advertisements to the database as well uh, mm -hmm. in the past. So will, yeah, will you be accepting once your database is up and running? Will you be accepting like? Um, information from other like can it will there be a way for people to give you information on their lost relative this was the last time they found them or something to that nature yeah i mean i i think um i think as we're, we're kind of chatting about just off off camera you know this is this is a this is an effort for for everyone you know i i don't know any benefit for me if someone had that information to not have a way to facilitate that um, you know, I think I think it's it's so important, um, and and so you know, as I've been I've been thinking about how to to make this transfer from effectively a database that's in Microsoft Access into 
uh, to get it to get it onto not only a, a web presence, but recognizing as well, there's going to be different audiences that want to access that information. So there's going to be, you know, potentially slavery scholars that want to do quantitative, um, um, you know, generate quantitative um, profiles, etc. Um, that's not the most user friendly, easily acceptable thing to put on a website. You know, I'd have to have some kind of raw file that they could access. But what I want for the public and for people, uh, you know, accessing the database it to be um, to be something that's easy to use, um, that's easy to search, um, and yeah, that kind of information. If we have someone uh, in the database that we can then, um, you know, add add to the profile through that type of information, then absolutely, I would I would always welcome it. And um, and I should say as well to to you know your viewers as well. Um, you know, if any of them want to 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 get in touch with any of that type of information or want to discuss the database in the meantime, uh, as I wait to put it online, uh, I'm happy to to share my email address as well um, uh, and chat with people um, for sure. Oh, thank you for that. And I'm glad that you mentioned the the quantifiability of the because while these are real people and these are real advertisements, there is data that potentially can be extracted from it. And I'm leading up to. You know, in order to put an advertisement in a newspaper costs money. And I guess I'm really curious about general profiles of the kinds of people who were, besides being enslavers, the kind of people that were actually putting these, paying for these advertisements. Mm. You know, were they all the likes of Thomas Jefferson and Pierce Butler and, you know, Thomas Jefferson? Mm. You know, we know that we're going to have the large scale enslavers up there, but, you know, I'm also curious was it the, the, the farmer? who may have only had maybe five or six enslaved people who didn't have the financial resources. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, well, I think, I think first and foremost, the, the, sheer, the sheer number of, of different uh, enslavers uh, that advertise for fugitives that I've recorded in the database is, uh, I think it, it stands at the moment about 2,000 um, slaveholding men and women. Um, and, you know, I, I have some quite comprehensive profiles for some, uh, and for others, I've got a name. Um, and again, th this is where, um, you know, I, I finished my PhD in 2018 uh, and went straight into the job at Bristol. So, um, and then obviously with COVID and things, you know, there's a lot of archives that I want to, mm -hmm. I want to get back into. Um, but I've got, um, you know, I, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that, that everyone that advertised was a, was a Thomas Jefferson or a, Pierce Butler, I think, um, you know, I, I think there were there were um, much smaller, uh, you know, slave slave in terms of, uh, you know, how many persons they, they uh, you know, owned. I, I think there were certainly uh, those that, you know, owned a handful who um, who advertised uh, for for fugitives. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah I, yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of information in the database that that will allow me to uh, and others to pursue. Um, some of those avenues. Well, again, one of the other groups I'm kind of fascinated by, and I'd like to learn to see if there's advertisements specifically for them, enslaved mariners. Because I've all, I mean, I've often wondered, well, if I was an enslaved mariner, I'm on a boat, I'm being trusted, the, the ship is going here, there, and everywhere. What would stop me from just walking off the ship and just disappearing into a different country or a different city or a different port? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I think in the database I've come across a few times where some of the some of the information can be can be quite vague, um, but certainly people who escaped from on board vessels that were that were basically um, in the process of being landed in places like Savannah, for example. Um, so I've I've had for where the ads actually alludes to uh, persons escaping from the the, the vessel itself. Um, you know, I, some of the details around about that, I'm not necessarily, um, you know, I, I've not followed them up yet, but, but I've certainly seen, um, you know, I don't think it's, it's, I think, I think resistance begins, um, you know, I, I think resistance is part of that journey from, from start to finish. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's a really uh, intriguing area uh, of research that still really needs to be, um, to be conducted. Well, we definitely go ahead. I, I was going to ask one of the questions. So there's a question from LaCrissa 
Sims, and she says, does your research document the slaves that ran away and got caught, or does your research also document those that reappear after freedom or emancipation? It's a, it's a very, very good question. Um, <laughs> it's a very good question. I, so I think I think I one of the things that I would I would say to to be quick because there's obviously there, there there's advertisements out there for um, you know sent for example published by jailers or you know taken up notices and things like that. One of the things that I'm trying to do at the minute is marry up the fugitivity advertisement with taken up advertisements so that I can. Uh, do some kind of cross checks and references and things like that. Um, at the moment, though, um, I use just the fugitive slave ads. Uh, so for persons that that had escaped, uh, that doesn't mean though that you know that, that it's it's impossible to uh, to basically track what happened. Um, one of the things that I've been able to do with the database, for example, is um, you know, so every every fugitive that is in the database is assigned a, a unique number, um, and basically, I can then um, you know look at the details. Every time I was inputting um, an enslaved person into uh, the database, I'm um, doing cross checks to see whether that person had appeared before, and in quite a few instances, I was able to find that maybe several years had passed uh, before the same person featured again, and so um, and and often it was a new. A new, a new uh, escape. Uh, so I was able to then kind of deduce from that that uh, that person may have been captured at some point, uh, but they had escaped again. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I think it is possible to uh, to do that. Certainly, cross referencing is something that uh, I think the resources are there to do mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I think one of the powerful things that I've always taken away from these advertisements is they contain descriptions. And for those of us who have researching ancestors who, who ran away, were fugitives, whatever you want to call them, um, that's the only indication of what that ancestor looked like that we're likely to ever have. They're not going to have a portrait. They're not going to have a photograph. Yeah. So from a genealogical point of view, they're like gold dust. Um, yeah. You know, even down to the minutia of scars, markings, which is, uh, we had another guest come on, Christina, uh, sorry, uh, I can't remember her, uh, Kiefer. Oh. I want to call her Catherine, but it's not Catherine. Katrina Kiefer, that's it. Okay. Um, she was talking about the, the scarification. You know, the, all of that, all of that rich detail are, are, is contained within these advertisements, mm -hmm. which to me just makes them absolutely priceless. And to touch on something that Dee Turner it's part of her question, but they even some of them even had skills. You know, you were seeing enslavers going, "Yes, Joe the blacksmith, Joe the the cooper." Or, you yeah. know, so not only we get to get a chance to imagine what they look like based on the descriptions, but we also know what they did. We knew what we know what their skill sets were. Yeah. Are there any other trinket, like really kind of golden nugget trinkets that people can pull from these advertisements? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that just as you were you were uh, saying that, I think absolutely. I think you you hit the nail on the head for sure. I mean, for me, for me, the um, I, as a historian, I un I understand the the nature of the source. The source is you know in its original purpose. I I come, I'm fully aware. But the way that I try and look at these ads is, the you know, fugitives, enslaved persons through their agency have compelled someone to advertise for them. I think that's a really important way of looking at it. Um, so, you know, we, we do have the narratives. We've got, you know, likes of Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, who were able to, you know, write their narrative. We've had people, you know, orally, you know, transmit their narrative. But for me, through, through you know, fugitives' actions, um, we have a record of advertised fugitivity. Um, and within those those advertisements, I mean, my, my database has around about 35 fields containing different types of information. Um, that may be around about the advertisement, the advertiser, the fugitive, uh, the reward, for example. Um, so all of that, that information is there. Um, to, to go back to to the kind of the, the the question I guess is other things that we've pulled so I absolute skills or um, so trades for example um, so I've got you know lots of people in the the database that um, were, were highly skilled often in in numerous trades 
um, I can cross-reference that with things like reward uh, to see whether, uh, you know, being a blacksmith, for example, drew a higher reward. Oh, right. uh, so I can do that for a, um, a comparison. Um, but I also have had students in the past look at things like, um, you know, um, whether uh, an enslaved person who could play an instrument, for example, was was described differently or was valued, uh, you know, uh, w w was was more kind of monetarily valued. Um, but I've also been able to look at things like clothing, um, like literacy rates, for example, been able to generate literacy rates from, um, you know, uh, you know, explicit acknowledgements that an enslaved person could read and write, uh, religiosity as well. So, um, again, um, you know, basically seeing the, the, the types of religion that was um, prevalent uh, among uh, enslaved persons. Um, but then also being able to, to use that information to build profiles as well. So actually building a profile to say, you know, uh, the average uh, in, enslaved runaway in Maryland was between this age and this age, was a certain height, was, you know, um, uh, you know, did they escape by themselves? Did they escape as part of a group? Um, and all those things have, there's been, you know, a lot of uh, really interesting and uh, I think really important information um, uh, that uh, at the moment, my, my PhD is fairly available online. People can uh, quite easily find it. And the, the second chapter of it has these statistical profiles, um, mm -hmm. which have all this information. So people can, it, it's out there if people want to, uh, if they want to, to read it. Um, and I even have come across more than a few that even described how the, the escaped persons spoke. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they'll say that they were well-spoken or you know, not as the case may be, but again, the, the level of detail can be incredible. The one that always makes me laugh though is when they take a horse. Yeah. Because again, part of the history that we get told on, on this end is that slaves didn't ride horses. Black people weren't supposed to ride, you know, it wasn't yeah. like when, when black people rode horses. Well, Billy and Joe and Sally or whoever who was liking it and they left with that horse, yeah. you know they weren't walking the horse. They left on that horse. So um, just, it's just those, those little details that I just personally find invaluable. Well, I think I think it's a, it's a really important point as well, Brian. I think, um, you know, th this is one of the reasons that, that I, I use the term sort of fugitivity, you know, fugitive slave ads. And I try to avoid saying runaway. Um, we're describing these people as runaways because the sheer complexity and methods that you know enslaved persons escaped through is is quite phenomenal. Um, so you know I've got examples of people escaping in canoes or uh, you know or on horseback or you know it's just a, a, and when you start or mailing to, themselves or mailing yes. themselves yes yeah. Um, yeah you know it's it it really is incredible. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I think speech is actually a huge part of the, the database. I've got a lot of information on uh, that, things like scarring as well, you know, being able to, uh, I don't know, like looking at physical descriptions and then trying to read beyond. So a lot, a lot of slaveholders, for example, in describing scarring would either blame a, blame a previous uh, slaveholder uh, or would, would basically uh, present themselves as ignorant of it. Um, and then suddenly what you can do with the database is you can isolate a particular slaveholder uh, and compare advertisements and suddenly you can find these, you know, one, one, um, one guy that I found in uh, Baltimore, um, all of his, um, basically everyone that he enslaved that, that escaped and was advertised for um, had half their head shaved and had their one eyebrow shaved off as well. And I remember thinking, this is this is really strange. Like, why, um, why is this? And then I I looked into this a bit further, and it turned out that when he suspected someone was going to escape, uh, this is what he would do. So that it made it really difficult for them to uh, conceal themselves. Um, wow. And so uh, you you suddenly you know you you build up these these stories and you get these insights. And you know I think I think advertisements in themselves. Uh, as individual ads will reveal a lot, but when you start to compare, and when you start to have ways in which to to isolate particular enslavers or to follow particular individuals, then uh, there, there's it really is um, you know there's just so much valuable uh, information in there, and we're still well, there, at the moment. Yeah, 
that was what I was going to ask you. Like, how is is how is your the database going to be searchable? Like, if I go there once it's available, yeah. What what are what are the criteria? What will I be able to search by? You, literally anything. <laughs> um, what I mean, one of the one of the the things is I, I know there's there's other there's other databases out there where um, what you're effectively looking at is a is a screenshot of a of like a, an image of an ad, an image of an advertisement, and the problem with that is really difficult to then search kind of keywords and uh, and things like that. So um, what I'd ideally like to have. Uh, is different, I, I guess, organized sort of thematically. So I want, you know, to, to be able to, you know, at, at front and center is is for the fugitive. I want your know, names, ages, place of birth, date of birth, all the stuff that's in the database. Um, I want that to be to be front and center. So I think that's what probably most people would uh, be interested in and would be using. Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to have sections where uh, for example, um, you know, the, the fugitivity itself. Um, one thing I've been looking into is whether I can use the um, so pl place of escape destination data as well as the publication data of the ad to plot that with like ArcGIS or something like that, you know, some mapping software um, to basically plot kind of fugitivity patterns as well. I think there's a huge potential there. Um, but also things like reward values and stuff as well. I want, I want to be able... Uh, to for, for people to even search if they knew a reward from the record, for example, and link that back to the individual as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, the, the database at, at the moment, these are the kind of questions exactly that I'm trying to think back to when I started this project and thinking, you know, what would have made my life easier if I was searching for uh, the individuals here? Um, and, and I'm trying to take that experience of designing the database and asking those questions. Uh, to design something that that people will um, that people will be able to easily navigate um, and will be able to to draw the the information that they're they're you know desperately looking for, which actually brings me to if you're open to this, if when you get to the um, the beta stage, the beta testing stage, I'm sure we can get you at least twenty to thirty people to to go into the website it, to go in there. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean I think. Um, you know, as I say, we're we're still we're still in um we're still really you know thinking about where what we're going to do here and what we, it's a conversation that I often have, particularly one colleague at Bristol that's that's really helping me out with this. Um, but I think um you know I, I think this needs to be something that we're we're working together on. Um, uh, and I think you know having having people be hands on with. Um, you know, having people hands on with it and, and being able to, you know, the little frustrations that you find when you're trying to use a website or things that we could do better or where we can, you know, um, make it easier to bring records together, then absolutely. I think we all benefit from a, uh, then a, a really fantastic resource that we've all had input in, which I think is important. Yeah, you so already got testers come I was going to say, I've, I've, been, I've been really blown away by, by that very kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's like, hey, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a lot of questions coming in, and I'm sorry if it seems as though we're ignoring a lot of them, but if we can keep them on the subject of the, the, the either fugitive slave ads in general or specifically this this database. Um, which brings me, I'm going to bring Donnie in because I know she, she has a, a, a viewer question that, that she wants to ask, a conversation about language and the word fugitive and why it's called the fugitive slave base. Cue you, Donya. <laughs> yes. So I had a conversation with one of our um, regular viewers and he wanted to know, he was like, it's a very interesting, you know, topic that you guys have, but he wanted to know if I was going to ask the question, why are you calling it the fugitive slave database? Um, his reasoning is because the narrative, uh, it's like Brian said, the language. They, why would you call them fugitives? Um, he made comments like the white people that helped them under the Underground Railroad were not considered fugitives. I did go in and I did explain. I'm like, well, that's because they weren't fugitives. They sat right there and they, they were there while these people were getting away. And the Fugitive Slave Act defines 
them as people who are running. So I would like for you to just go ahead and answer why you named it the Fugitive Slave Database. Sure. I, I think, and you know, I, th I think the the question in itself is actually it's a really important question. Um, and I think I think absolutely, you know, it, you know, on a on a broader point, I think terminology is so so important. You know, I, I spend most of my you know academic term trying to to get people to to use the word enslaved person. You know, because you know because that's what we should be we should be doing. Um, and I think. On that, I mean, it's not the first time I've I've had someone ask that question. Um, I, I think the I think really you you were were straight to really the reason that, that I do, which is the the Fugitive Slave Act in seventeen ninety three makes pretty clear who a fugitive is. Um, I think in terms of the way that it the the escaped and slave persons are um, are discussed within the sources. Uh, as fugitives, and then you know, and I th and I think as well, you know, people um, like Frederick Douglass, you know, um, I I think the terminology that the enslaved persons were using, they saw themselves as fugitives as well, and 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 while I understand completely that there's the you know, the I, I can understand where the the question's coming from, but I'd also say that I think within with using the word fugitivity or the status of fugitive, I think it also I think it really gets to the heart as to to what these people were embarking upon and the laws that were being used to effectively hunt them, uh, and understanding that context and understanding that despite the the threat of recapture, um, despite the threat of punishment that that would follow recapture, sometimes even a death as well, um, these people were embarking on the most heroic escape attempts. Um, but, but also recognizing, and I think it, it really gets to the heart of, of this, is that even if you escaped out of, um, you know, a quote unquote slave state, you know, you could still be hunted under this law. Yeah. And that, that vulnerability, I, I want to capture that. You know, I think it's it's really important. You know, I, this is why my, my book, for example, you know, I'm trying to even complicate the idea of what freedom was, um, you know, freedom from physical bondage. Um, and then saying, you know, could you could you actually gain freedom from such a, a psychologically oppressive system when, for example, you're a fugitive, um, you know, because you can be you can be legally hunted. Um, so I think it's I think it's a really important question um, that your your viewer raises. Um, uh, but but I, I use fugitive or, or fugitive and fugitivity with um, with that in mind. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. That's then cool. we have another question from Pamela Boykin. She says, when can the public expect the database to be up and running for usage? That's a, an excellent question. Um, <laughs> it's a very, very good question. I, I think I think what I'd say at the moment is that the um, there's still a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things to work out um, behind the scenes. Um, there's still a lot of testing to do and things like that. What I would say, though, in, in way of, um, you know, I, I, I understand this resource is something that people want to, to access. Um, I would always say, to, you know, any of your viewers, if, if there is something in particular that they think the database might contain, um, then, you know, please get in touch with me and I can I can have a look through the database and see whether I've got any information that would would help uh, in the meantime. I think we're probably still a little bit off with getting the um with, with getting it online but uh you know I, I hope i hope it progresses pretty pretty quickly um, and then um callie myatt hmm. she she came in a little late she was having some connection problems so we already asked about um if you would receive submit submissions so i guess now her question would really be going towards how can they submit if they have information to the database yeah, so I, I think I think at the moment, um, as we're working out how to get the database online, uh, I would say that if anyone has information, then would be to email me directly with that information, and we can have a correspondence that way. Um, I'm hoping, though, um, you know, once the database is on there, I want to to have an interface that makes it really easy for people to submit this information. Um, so I, I some kind of you know 
comment box, text box, potentially linked to the, um, you know, the the individual profile um, for the for the for the person to then input that information. And the question that I have is, you know, people, researchers, a lot of the researchers watching the show, Donia, myself, we spend probably more time that is than is healthy going through enslavers' probate records and deeds and sales deeds and estate inventories to, to find our ancestors. And after a while, it can become a bit much. Mm -hmm. You have to like take you have to take a break and do something else. What has it been like for your team? Just because I can imagine you know, Lord only knows how many of these advertisements you've seen and you've entered into the database. I guess, what is your emotional kind of takeaway from it all? Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, w w one thing I'd say on, on, on the, t the, the team, first and foremost, so when I, when I did this project, I obviously I worked with very closely with, um, with, with Colin uh, Nicholson designing the database, but the input of the ads was, was basically me for, for three and a half years. Um, so uh, to, give, to give a little bit of insight into um, what that involved, um, I, I didn't want to use keyword searches um, when I was searching for the ads. I wanted to go through newspapers um, I, as comprehensively as I could. Um, so basically, I, I looked at every newspaper that was available to me in Georgia and Maryland between 1790 and 1810. Uh, and then it was just a matter of every single day just working through the newspapers. So every page, if I came across an advertisement, then it went into the database. Now. One of the decisions that I took when I was doing that, which I think is is more directly related to the question, is I didn't um, at that stage I, I didn't really follow any of these stories yet. I, I kind of did um, the input first and foremost, and I could see little things along the way that were starting to to really get my interest and really sort of thinking, well, this might be um, something really important here that that needs further research. Um, but I, I very deliberately held off until the end stage to then start to to work through um, the ads. And yeah, I, I've still, even now within that database, there's still stories that I'm discovering every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's really incredible. You know, I, I find that because I, I, I use the source a lot to teach. I use the database with with students and really depending on what we're, we're covering that day, I often find myself maybe a couple hours each day just dipping into the database and and and, and trying to really um you know I understand what they're telling me what the, the the ads are telling me and just some of the stories are are remarkable um and they're you know i i always look at it and i i try to keep the perspective that i'm i'm reading about this individual um because that individual's actions because that individual decided to to, to escape physical bondage. Um, and I, I think from my point of view as well, knowing that I can, that I've, I've had this little like historical snapshot that I can hopefully, um, you know, uh, that, that people, it may be useful to someone, um, you know, searching for a family member. Or, um, so that that to me sort of is the thing that, that drives me. But I, I think, you know, you, you you think that you know a system that's cruel and then you'll come across something else and you say, wow, that just, that's incredible. It just got worse. Exactly. It's, it, 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 it's amazing. Okay, so this brings me to, a, it's about this, but it's not about this. As a historian, you you went to school, you you know, you're a PhD historian. Did you learn this in school? No. And what, do you think that you would have found history even more um interesting had you learned it i i absolutely would have found it more interesting if i'd known about this i, I certainly neither you know primary school secondary school i didn't learn any of this stuff uh mm. as i said i was i was second year at university when um when i came across this topic for the first time and really um started to become fascinated by it um that said, though, I mean, one, one of the things that, that I do feel really quite passionately about is, you know, I, I've done a lot of, um, you know, work now with with kind of um, with with school kids. And um, even just a few weeks ago, I did I did something um, 
with with potential university um, students um, and using the sources. And we just we for two hours we literally just went through uh, advertisements. And I had them, you know, to say, well, this is what we have. Let's be historians for two hours and let's see what we can find out about uh, these individuals. And just had them with their, their computers out. They were following some of the names and the stories and. And, you know, they, they left and they were just, they had never done this before. And you, you could tell, like, they, they, they just really engaged with it. And I think um, I, I could see a lot of the, the, the same way, I think, that, that I felt when I started using, um, using the ads and, 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 and really exploring this topic. Um, I, and I think it's really important, you know, that, that, we, that we do teach this stuff. Like, we, we should be teaching it. Um, very early on um and th there's no reason not to um there's no reason not to teach this stuff at all um the sources are there <laughs> the the historiography is there um yeah. you know it's, it's, it's there they just won't share it i it's i don't know that's a pet peeve of mine that's something that bothers me something severe because once i started looking in the newspapers and learning the things that I was learning. And I'm like, why didn't anybody tell me this in school? Like, this is crazy. And, and, I, and I also I also think as well that, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, it's historians uh, and, and it's, you know, people that, that from, you know, that, that find themselves drawn to, to, you know, slavery as a subject. You know, I, I think, you know, we, we, we want to know about people. You know, we, we want to know stories, we want to know experiences. And I, I just think this is like, you know, um, I, I don't know, the, 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 the stories are there, the, everything's there, um, you know? And, and yeah. but yeah, I, I share your frustration, Donya. I, um, I think it should be taught as well. What? Well, again, I guess my feeling on it is it's the word, slave, slave, mm. slavery. It's become mm. so abstracted mm. that it no longer requires any emo any emotion where you're what you're doing and other people like you are doing what we're all doing is humanizing them you know, right that's what i was going to say mm -hmm. yeah because you because you mentioned the word you know we want to know this stuff about people brian said it nicer than me so <laughs> 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 because i was going to say given the fact and and I'm still going to say it. Given the fact that you are in the UK, you guys have a different thought process than those in the United States. So when you're looking at it, you're looking at it like, yeah, we want to know about these people, what happened to them, what, what, where did it go, this and the third. Whereas people in the United States are like, you're not enslaved, why are you worried about it now? Mm -hmm. So they don't have the thought process that these were actually people mm -hmm. and they you can't make them realize that they're people until you have the conversation with them like mm -hmm. that time when i had the conversation with the guy and i'm like don't you talk to your grandmother you talk to your kids about your grandparents and you point all that out and you do all those things it's like yeah but what does that have to do with this i said well that's what i'm doing yeah. mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden his whole mind changes his own mindset changes because guess what that was a person and she did have children who had children who had children. Mm -hmm. So then their, their mindset is not even on the thought process of being people. People are not slaves. Yeah. They don't equate them as two. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can jump in quick, Britain has recently started to have that hardcore conversation because around the time of George Floyd's death, the Black Lives Matter protests that were happening here were kicking off over there, and specifically Bristol, because I remember that one of those statues got pulled down. Mm -hmm. um, and people in America were very confused, going, what does Black Lives Matter have to do with Britain? Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, the whole starting to have the conversation about Britain's links to mm -hmm. slavery seems to really starting to happen at, at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think from... Um, certainly in, in Bristol, it was um, it, it was quite something, um, you know. And I even even prior to that, I think um, you know what one of the things that, that I take a lot of uh, I, you know, a lot of part from is 
our, our students, um, you know, the conversations that we have, they, they want to know about this stuff. You know, they want to know um, uh, and they want and they want to do something about it. Um, and it's, it's, you know, when you sit, it's so refreshing, you know, and um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I, you know, several conversations with with um, with with students that were, um, you know, around about this this time where they were going to have the protest and. You know, they said, you know, I, I didn't know much about this until I did I did your course. Uh, wh- what can I do to, you know, and, and, and I just, I think it's 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 so refreshing. Um, but but certainly in Bristol, you know, it, it generated a lot of a lot of discussion. Um, the coast and statue being uh, toppled. Um, and subsequently, you know, there, there's been a lot of, um, you know, uh, conversations over what should replace uh, the statue, where that statue should be and things like that. I've had colleagues working on, on on those types of conversations. So, you know, I, I think it's um, you know, I think that the Black Lives Matter movement, we we, you know, it's it's a global movement, and um, you know, I think um, as I say, I think these conversations are they're they're, you know, they they should have been had a long time ago, um, and now we're having them. I'm I'm glad we're having them, um, and as I say, I think I think seeing our, our kind of you know, students and stuff being involved I think is just so important okay. um like to in the, I guess the final minutes of the show kind of talk about the repositories and places that you found the advertisements so for my research specifically in South Carolina there's an amazing service called accessible archives mm-hmm. if you google accessible archives I'm going to say to the audience it is wicked expensive it's <laughs> the kind of expensive that will make your toes curl and your eyes kind of widen. So if you belong to an organization that can afford to have organizational memberships, it is amazing. But but again, that's where I found all of those old South Carolina colonial newspapers. I'm just curious about the repositories and archives that you've used. Sure. So I, uh, I think to be, to be completely transparent on it, Brian, I think, I think I found the the price as well to be, um, (laughs) Very, very expensive. I, I once tried to. Uh, so, so my university where I did my PhD, we had access to some of the Redex, uh, some of the Redex um, uh, series of, of newspapers. Um, I remember thinking, well, I, I don't have as many as I'd like, so I was going to buy some, um, <laughs> buy some access, and quickly realised that my budget was um, nowhere near. Let's put it that way. Um, so so actually that that in a, in a way brought up a sort of methodological hurdle that was well you know i i'm just not gonna have access to certain um certain databases um what ones do i have access to and how can i use them and so one one that i found really useful was a uh, genealogy bank i was using genealogy bank to search for fugitive oh, nice. um oh. that allowed me to to there was a few areas where uh, I had gaps in the coverage, um, so I was able to rectify those. And then later on, um, when I got to Bristol, we had we had access to um, some different resources as well. The the one thing I would I would say though, I you know I, I always think back to even Franklin and Schweninger's work, um, you know, runaway slaves, rebels on the plantation, and there was a associated database with with that particular project. Um, and I know there was scholars long before that that, that started. Mm-hmm projects with with fugitive slave ads i mean we're talking here you know to to undertake what i've done if i had to sit in an archive you know accessing newspapers that way even on microfilm for example it would just have been so difficult to do um and so i'm i'm really reliant on digitized uh newspapers um you know i i and and i think we're just i think places like redex and genealogy bank they're just they're constantly expanding um you know and i i i don't know if i'm allowed to say but like you know genealogy bank is is very affordable as well so if you're conducting that type of research then it's very different to some of the thousands and thousands of pounds or dollars that you pay for uh, some of those those larger institutional um uh, repositories as well and another brilliant resource is family search which is free and again don't use the main search function select catalog search the state that you want to find information on and a lot of them will have newspapers so for instance north carolina i can't north carolina has so many online archives and i cannot remember which one it is but whichever one it is it has a lot of its 
colonial era newspapers. Um, mm. Again, invaluable. I think Georgia has just released some of yeah. its um, colonial newspapers. I think so I think I noticed on um, I think on Twitter that I, I've noticed there was a I, I can't remember the exact handle, but there's just a huge amount of uh, sources coming out at the moment, digitized sources that. <laughs> It's just such an exciting time to be to be doing this type of research. So again, for our audience, there is unfortunately there is no one overarching repository that will have all of these old. I wish one day it'll happen, but they're just spread out all over the place. Uh, as a matter of fact, like I said, I use a service called Accessible Archives. They've got South Carolina papers and a whole bunch of others. They're based in California, so. Wow. They're associated with one of the universities out there. I think that's the kind of funder for this service. Um, but yeah, that's what they did. They just licensed and, and got all these old newspapers and, and digitized them. So and I wanted, to ask you, I wanted to ask you one more quick question by Lucrecia Sims. She said, would you consider adding leaves that were stolen? I'm under, I'm trying to understand how would you know, but I found that that question was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so again, I, I I would say that by because of the, the nature of uh, what we're talking about, someone being stolen, um, the records are probably going to be quite difficult for for that. Um, however, I mean, I, I'm fully, uh, you know, I, I just think anything that can supplement uh, the database in terms of, you know, it's going to be um, fugitive slave ads primarily, but as I say, the, the taken up ads and things like that as well. Uh, I see no reason that we can't, we can't add those. Um, again, it's just another piece of the jigsaw, you know, that, that we need to, uh, it, well, it's, on, it's on me really and, and my team to find ways to, uh, to make sure that people can submit that information because it's so important to the, the, the stories that we're, we're uncovering here. Mm -hmm. uh, so absolutely. And again, to tell people you can research people through these advertisements. I've done it. Uh, George Washington had fugitive slaves, and I actually tracked them to Canada and found some of their some of their descendants. Thomas Jefferson had one. Had well, he didn't have one. He had many. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you you know you can pick up the trail. I think one of the wildest ones that I found for George Washington is one of them went to Liberia. You know, they're like, listen, I just want to get out of North America. I just want to go somewhere else. Um, mm. Yeah. And again, you know, people leaving for the Caribbean. That was yeah. another, another, another destination. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to really emphasize with people, you know, there are all kinds of genealogically useful clues. As Sean said earlier, you know, you've got the enslaver's name for a yeah. start. You find out where, you know, you know the state or the county that they lived in. These are all really useful clues. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, I, I think I, I don't know if I said or not, but I mean one of the one of the first. Um, so it was just a, a curiosity. I, I didn't know when the first ad uh, w was published, and I found this ad from 1705, where you have a person of African descent and uh, an Indigenous American who escaped together um, from I think Maine, and I lost I lost the the track of. Where they were, where they were headed, and it literally was the smallest. I think like a few, a few sentences within a newspaper, like three or four months later, in which the 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 enslaver, who was also the the owner of the newspaper, was basically trying to say to the public, trying to attract advertisement, said, by way of advertisement, uh, these guys were caught, and they're caught in South Carolina. Um, yeah. Quite a, you know, quite a, quite a journey, and and even in that moment, although this person is trying to almost you know use use the ad as, as propaganda to attract to attract more um, investment in the newspaper, it, it sort of put a full stop on that story to at least that story of fugitivity. It allowed us to say, well, yeah, I, I sort of know the outcome of that. Um, then I lost the the individuals after that, but the the information is there. Um, even if it if it doesn't you know necessarily you know look like a fugitive slave ad or you know a taken up ad that information can be you know as as public as a newspaper um, and it's just trying to see beyond the maybe the the what it is on first impression and and, and trying to um, trying to bring those resources together um, it can mm -hmm. certainly be done. Um, 
and we should be doing it. Right. Yes, and thank you, Renato, because he reminded me what the, the website I was struggling to remember was called, and it's digitalnc.org. Oh, yes. Yeah, fantastic resource, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I mean, our hours tend to just move like they like 20 minutes. I don't know why they do that, <laughs> but they do. But I am so thankful that you did that. And when the database is up and running, you are more than welcome to come back to Genealogy Adventures and say, hey, it's up and running, and this is what you do to get it done. So we are, we are here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. again, you know, as we said off camera, you've done, you know, you and you and your expanded team, and you've done so much of this work. Mm -hmm. So we want to get it out there and shout about it and, and let people know that it that it exists yeah. <laughs> and to use it. And to yeah, use it. That, that's that's the key thing. I, I want people to be able to access it and use it. Um, but yeah, and then it's it's fantastic to see so many of your viewers as well want to be involved in that. It's that's really. Oh, they're really ready. They're ready. Yeah. They, were born, they, were, they were born ready. Yes, yes. <laughs> we love them. We love them. We love them. So, so um, next week, we are yeah. kicking off Women's History Month. So this is the last show for Black History Month. And we are talking about the three mothers of gynecology. And that is going to be an emotional show. It is going to be a humdinger. But we are going to learn stuff. Because I, I actually, I don't know that much. I know a little bit. I know I'm going to I'm going to learn a lot next week. Yes, bring your tissues because it's going to be something. Women's History Month is going to be awesome, guys. We are really focusing on people who have not been focused on it on like at all. Like Brian was saying, we're going to cover so many different people. We're even going to cover my favorite person, Kathy Williams, also known as William Kathy. You guys met her as Cuffy in the harder they fall, the American Western that came out. So I'm, I'm, I can't wait for that show. <laughs> so it's just going to be a lot. But again, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for such a such a fascinating interview, and thanks to all your viewers as well for for tuning in. No, again, thank you as always, and um, I, we look forward to staying in touch. Absolutely. All right, so you guys, we are getting ready to sign off. I want to make sure you guys have a great Sunday. Make sure I say have a great Sunday. Enjoy your dinner. Enjoy your family. And love you. <laughs> and as always, thank you for sharing this hour with us. Yes, as always. Even See if it seems week. like 20 minutes. Right. <laughs> See you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>